he was very much into materialism and and rationalism. Okay, but the point is, there's no life in this picture. You can believe in materialism. You can believe that it's never enough. You know, you have to get a 500 foot yacht, or you haven't lived. But the reality is that there's no life in this picture. Things don't give you life. So you have to first understand that. That's a critical point, a critical thing. And it's a critical difference between Freud and Jung. You know, Jung said at one point that if it weren't for the fact that Freud was totally besotted with uh, materialism, he would be with them still today because he felt he was like a father figure for quite a, quite a long while. And so the point is that, well, that's the point. Yeah. And some people are evil such that they need to be locked up and segregated from society. Right. Um, and in some jurisdictions, they will actually right. get the death penalty. But and, I suppose the highest level of appreciation of, of love, so I suppose, is agape. And, and that would be where, you know, even the most heinous person could hopefully realize that, you know, even God might still love them, you know, <clears throat> possibly. You know, well, presumably so, that's why they have a priest or a minister go with you to the death chamber. But, <laughs> but some people are uniquely evil. And Dr. Jung was very clear that, that evil is a great power and that we must uh, be conscious of that. And he was very critical of the church, especially the Catholic church, but all church, um, for the last 2,000 years for... Uh, basically, uh, writing evil out of the out of the religion and turning Satan into a, um, into a child's fairy tale, instead of recognizing that Satan is a is a real thing in the world. And um, you know, he says this at one point. I think in in um, Civilization in Transformation, uh, or in Transition in Volume 10, uh, where he says that, um, um, you know, when, when Satan raises his head, uh, the whole world uh, shudders. And, um, you know, I think all of us can think of examples, but we're not going to go into them tonight. Okay, understanding of science. So, um, Freud thought of, of psychology as an empirical science, meaning that he wanted to solve for X and hold all things, you know, all variables out of that equation. And this is the way a lot of psychologists work today. And Jung, on the other hand, thought that psychology was a science, but it could be used to support religious, spiritual, and cultural ideas. But in order to do that, you have to take all the things that the scientific method wants to hold constant and include them in your understanding. So it's not, uh, psychology is not uh, a science that can be solved for X. It simply can't be. The statistical method is not the right way to go uh, for psychology because, you know, you can predict, you know, you can pre predict things with statistics, but then what about the outliers, right? And so you have to be able to, um, to really know what somebody's thinking maybe if you're going to understand somebody. Uh, or you're going to understand what they're going to do. Um, so, any thoughts about that before I move on? Why did Jung call his particular uh, way a science? Well, because um, Jung thought of himself as a scientist, um, and Edinger points that out in his. Uh, interview with Lawrence Jaffe, which I 
transcribed, and you can find it on the Archetype in Action website. But he thought of himself as a scientist, but understanding that he couldn't, he wasn't going to solve for X. He wasn't going to say, if this, then this. Okay, because the issue is causality, and some things aren't causal in that way. Was there something specific that caused my marriage to fall apart, my first marriage? No. And so if you solve for X, you can't find the causal reason. Um, I gave you some example uh, tonight about how my wife kept pushing my buttons even after uh, an ar uh, argument was long over. Okay, so that's one thing. But, you know, I never imagined that I would ever get a divorce. Okay, for the first almost 17 years of my marriage, it never occurred to me that I would get a divorce. And, you know, finally, after 16 years and eight months, all of a sudden, bang, it was like, it was like water dripping on porcelain. It drip, drip, drips, and this porcelain is still there. And finally, one day, one more drip, and the porcelain is worn through. And once that happened, it was over. That was the end. Uh, I was wondering if he came to his conclusions based on his own experience, plus the case studies he did of the various people that came to him, and right. out of that material came his written ideas. Right. So he considered it empirical because he had, he had examined 80,000 dreams in his career, and he had had a long career of helping people as a psychiatrist and psychologist you know, mainly as a psychologist, although he was officially a psychiatrist, uh, it's a, it was a little different than that it is today. I mean, today, a psychiatrist is an MD and is allowed to prescribe drugs, while a psychologist usually doesn't prescribe drugs and needs a, a psychiatrist to collaborate with them for, you know, for somebody that needs drug help. Um, with something, let's say, like schizophrenia. But in Jung's day, he was mainly what we would think of today as a psychologist, I think. And he certainly wasn't prescribing drugs. Um, in fact, I can't think of any example where he said that he prescribed drugs. He, he did talk about taking mescaline or something like that at one point, but... But he definitely thought of himself as an empirical scientist in the, in the sense that what was going on in his clinic was definitely real, but there was not, you know, there was not X in that clinic that could solve for all mental health issues. You know, the, a psychologist from Jung's perspective had to be someone with a deep knowledge of mythology and and other fields who, uh, you know, depending on what came up in the clinic, could respond to the, um, to the uh, individual in a specific way that w is entirely unpredictable. And it depends on the relationship and the, and the transference relationship that's going on between um, the patient and the, and the psychologist. Um, all right, so moving, is that... I'd just like to say something about the science idea here. Yes. So, um, you know, based on things I've learned from you and other sources, I'm thinking Freud carried forward s in the spirit or the ideology of psychology being a science that's empirical and that we can make better human machines. So positive psychology, in a sense, is also about making a better human machine and cognitive behavioral therapy likewise, so that people can fit into their right. social economic system, whether it's good or bad or deleterious or not, where um, a lot of people end up getting psychological help so that they can feel that they're fitting a bit better in this 
somebody calls it a global casino insane asylum insane <laughs> asylum <laughs> economy um and then and 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 i think freud probably would he have been more um acceptable to the theologians because as long as he's doing that freud would be staying in his lane whereas jung he was su suggesting that there's a inner god image in everyone and and now that's a threat to the to the theologians and business as usual where you know the the back then the roman catholics had their mass in latin that not very many people understood yeah. and even all these other uh, organizations denominations have their long lists of creeds which i've been exploring and holy cow there's pages and pages of these creeds of different uh, and you know, the Belgic Confession and the Westminster Confession. You know, you have to read pages and pages in order to, if you really want to know what the particular denomination believes. Yeah, and I, so, I dare you to apply that in your life. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. so, you know, that's where Young was, like, he was just obviously a threat to all of this business as right. usual. Well, anyway, that's, that's you I'm know, saying. that's where in this next point, which is understanding religion, uh, spirituality, and, and Freud thought, I mean, the, uh, you know, Freud wrote this book called The End of an Illusion or something like that, which was very anti-religion, and Freud was an atheist and, and uh, a rationalist and, you know, the whole, the worst of the worst of the... 19th century in a sense because he was pushing rationalism and materialism um, and um, you know but you don't get happiness that way and that's the issue Jung felt that you know that spirituality is a is an essential part of developing the human psyche and this is a, a big debate that is currently going on between Debbie and me because she's totally gaga over uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, the issue with artificial intelligence, from my point of view, is um, artificial intelligence, I say to Deb, is not going to replace us for a very long time. Okay, because yes, you can teach a robot to have every bit of human knowledge, okay? I, I grant you that that would be possible. Uh, and you can teach them to interact in extremely um, sophisticated ways, all causally, but in no way do you touch, I mean, it's like having it's like data on Star Trek. You know, he, he looks like a human, he reacts like a human, he behaves like a human the most, most of the time, but he's not a human. And a human has, it's like having a persona face, but nothing behind it. And so how do you replace what, has, what God has put in over the last three and a half billion years? You know, we don't even understand it yet. Uh, you know, modern science, my modern neurology and brain science can't tell you anything about how the brain works. They can they can hook you up to electrodes, electrodes, and they can say, well, if you're having sex, it's going to light up this part of your brain, and so on. But you know, I. I, I tell Deb, let me know when some scientists can plug into your brain and show what you're dreaming on television, okay? That, that's when I think science will know something about the human psyche. And at this point, uh, at this point the, the physical scientists can't even explain what consciousness is. They can't even define it. <laughs> well and i think an example too you know some people I, I when i do look at these videos it is kind of scary look at the modern robots that are 
doing cartwheels, literally, you know, and you're thinking, yeah, you put a gun in the hand of that robot and, uh, and we're in trouble. Yeah, I'm, but not, I'm not saying they can't destroy us. I, I think yeah, they, but they by do. the same token, what you were saying, though, we have to remember um, intelligence, human intelligence is never going to be very easily replicated because uh, take, for example, um, the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria, Syria and you know, NATO is also involved in some of those. Um, you have these people who are just equipped with very rudimentary types of weaponry, and they're a formidable, formidable foe to the United States military machine, mm -hmm. right? right? So, in these robots that they're creating, you know, somebody will probably say, well, gee, all you have to do is throw this wrench into that slot and that thing's disabled, <laughs> you know, kind of yeah, thing. that's right. <laughs> You know, I, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot going on that we don't know about, thankfully, okay? There's a lot of top secret stuff that's happening that we don't know about, and I'm, I'm very happy we don't, because if we had to think about it, our minds would probably explode. Anyway, let's let's move on to this last topic, and then we can have a general potpourri. Uh, practicing psychology. Fred believes in frequently seeing his patients. He would have six sessions a week. Jung saw his patients twice a week, or even less. I mean, he saw uh, Fowler McCormick like once every six months, and yet he was McCormick was. Jung's patient for like 30 years or something like that. So Jung's point was that we, you know, our psyche has to evolve. It has, has to have time to interact with the world. And, you know, Freud was sort of like Mr. Fix-It. Let's fix it this way. And if we don't get it quite right because you had a dream last night, we'll fix it another way. And so that's Mr. Fix-It. But Jung said, you know, let these things uh, emerge and, and give them time to emerge. So we transform, we surely transform over our lifetime. And the biggest transformations are like four or five transformations from childhood to young adulthood to maturity to old age, let's say. Those are the main transformations. And, you know, within those transformations, other transformations can take place. So, for example, uh, if we look at the current events, um, you know, basically, the, you know, the people that watch Fox News or MSNBC aren't going to change their positions mostly, but some things will change. And what happened in the Nixon situation was that, you know, gradually people's minds were, were changed. And it took, it took, a long time. I mean, in 1972, uh, Richard Nixon won a landslide and had been elected. <laughs> he won 49 states in the Electoral College in 1972. 19 months later, he was out of office. And the reason that happened was that the Republican Party recognized that when public opinion went against him at 57% that it was lost and, and he couldn't, he couldn't keep going. And so they, you know, they went to the white house and made him an offer. He couldn't refuse. <laughs> and that's, what's going to happen here. There's not going to be an impeachment trial. There's no way. Um, because the, the, um, the Republican party can't stand it stand that they can't stand that it would happen because the blowback from that would be so enormous and so there's not going to be a trial that's my prediction i'm a, so this is skip the profit i could be wrong but uh, this is the way profits work is they look at the past and and predict the future so 
that's what I'm doing here. I'm looking at the past that I'm saying, you know, the same as with Harrison Ford in the movie Witness, when Harrison Ford is asked whether the little boy Samuel is going to have to appear at trial, and Ford looks into the camera and he says, there isn't going to be a trial. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's that's the way it is, but it's it's a process that is taking the collective unconscious of the American people through a long, long psychological process, which is what which was Dr. Jung's way of dealing with it. And if you would like to join our panel, um, please write me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com, and I will be happy to add you to our panel for discussion. And, um, and let's see how it goes. So next week, I'm going to do my best to talk about this. And, and one thing, this, so this is uh, Carl Jung and quantum, quantum physics and the spiritual mind. And um, one thing I wanted to mention that in the advanced group, um, Dr. Thomas Arst, who's one of the, um, one of the editors of uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, and wrote the profound first essay in that book, um, has agreed to uh, have an interview with um, the advanced reading group uh, shortly after the first of the year on the relationship between uh, Dr. Jung and um, physicist Wolfgang Pauli. And, um, He's been studying that and working with that for 20 years. And so this is the book I'm talking about, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And you can see his name here, Thomas Arst. And this is volume one, but there are now three volumes. And Dr. Arst wrote the first essay, which is truly profound. And you, I actually read it into the YouTube channel, so you can find it on the homepage of this channel. And it's in two, um, it's in two uh, videos. So if you go to the homepage of this channel, you'll be able to find Dr. Ars' uh, essay. Kambir uh, Atwal says, how is it that Jung was able to figure out the things he did Absolutely awe inspiring and mind boggling. Um, I don't think we'll ever know. Um, the, uh, you know, Dr. Edinger commented that he had devoted 40 years to talking about Dr. Jung, and um, he said that his, his intellect was so gigantic that it was, it, no one could quite grasp it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I certainly see that because I've been doing this. This is the 151st session of this group <laughs> since I began three and a half years ago. And, you know, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface. I mean, there are huge areas that I haven't even addressed as yet. And, um, James Hollis, who's a leading Jungian analyst, uh, told me that there are still approximately 100,000 letters that have not yet been published uh, and lots of other material. Uh, and, um, you know, just uh, on the Red Book alone, um, Sonu Shandasani, I think next year, is going to publish uh, some of the black books, some part of them, which the black books are actually the starting point for the red book. And uh, some people have said that, you know, when he edited it the first time to put it into the red book here, um, he cut out about half of the material. So there's lots more that we haven't even, none of us have even read yet. And so, um, you know, how, how he became that brilliant, I don't know. He was an introvert, and his father 
helped him with uh, religious things, but, you know, and not only Christian, but his father was an Arabic speaker and reader and, and uh, helped him with uh, Latin and Greek. And so he just had a vast amount of knowledge that he brought to his topic. And, uh, Clear, pure Catherine Tarot says, I can't believe I am here catching the live. Well, we're delighted to have you. And we'll have to think about how we can do a little more Tarot. I've been thinking about offering Tarot readings. <laughs> but I, somehow I don't think I'll ever have the time to do it anymore. But uh, it's, a, it's an amusing thought anyway. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, so Nancy, we'll see you on, uh, on Wednesday and Miles and anyone else who wants to write to me can ask to join the advanced group and, uh, good night from Annapolis. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. So, and so, good clear, night. yeah, clear, pure Catherine Tarot. Uh, if you don't know of my Tarot background, uh, there's a whole uh, playlist uh, where I teach Tarot, and uh, I think it's 18 videos that I did on teaching the Tarot and learning the Tarot. So you might find that amusing, something to laugh at. Uh, but actually, I'm a passable Tarot reader sometimes. <laughs> So good night all. Take care now. Bye-bye.